the Board of Liquor Control to order. And first up is public comment only from the Liquor Board. Seeing none, approval of the agenda. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Next we have new business, which is the first class liquor license for 802 Pizza. Anybody want to approve that one? I will move the approval of the first class license for 802 Pizza. I'm second it. All those Can in I favor? Ask a question? Yeah. I was moving, Pat. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's Alice Pizza with a new owner. Yes. That's pretty nice. Yep. Yeah. Okay. She didn't get another one. Three pizza joints in one town would be quite a few, right? <laughs> we could have them all. Look at the gas stations. Yeah. All right. We and have Cumberland movie. Farms has pizza, too. So. Oh. <laughs> Just saying. Fresh from the freezer? Hardly qualified. Where did they make it there? <laughs> uh, who knows? Gas station reworm. <laughs> I'm a Jersey kid, and it doesn't qualify. <laughs> All right, we have a motion to the second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And carries. Next up, a motion to adjourn. So moved. So motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Now we'll call the select board meeting to order. Public comment. This is anything not on the agenda? None? Approval of the agenda. So moved. Well, before you do that, oh, did you want to add? Um, yes. You want to go oh, down? No. Give a little amendment. Um. Yeah. Under new business, if we could add the um, discussion on the emergency radio system for the fire department. Okay. Where's that going? M. At the end. Yeah. After assembly permits. That'll be M. Um, All right, a motion to uh, the agenda with the amendment. So moved. That I spaced and asked for. Can I take one of these? Wait, sure. Ooh, I was looking down. Did you hear the uh, second? Perry, no, we didn't Fine. get one no, yet. Second. There we go. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Consent calendar, meeting minutes and warrants. Move to approve that. Second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. New business. Consider consider setting a tax rate. We have materials in your packet. Dennis is here to join us. This is the annual ritual of joy and mirth. A necessary exercise in government. Um, the recommended rates are included in the packets as is uh, how they broke down the different components to come up with them. And then the historical comparison that includes four fiscal years on the different segments that make up the total tax rates. So it includes the municipal, local agreement, and the police district on the local government side, and then the school, homestead, and non-residential tax rates on the education side. And so the proposed rate for fiscal year 22, if you're a homestead, so primary resident, 0.8254 is the municipal rate, 1.5655 is the school rate, and then the local agreement rate is the 0 0.0051. And then for those also inside the police district, there's a 0.2190. These are all per 100 of assessed value for a grand total of 2.6150 per 100. Same categories, rates all break down the same except for the school statewide tax rate for non-residential would be 1.5968 for a total of 2.6463. And this is, what is this from last year, Dennis? Roughly about three cents, 3.44 cents if I'm doing my math quickly and correctly. On the municipal rate only, um, fraction of a penny on the police tax rate, and then looks like kind of a big jump on the local agreement rate, but that's a small portion of the overall. 
And Dennis, school rates are about two, two and a half cents. I have a question, Dennis. Good presentation. I'm curious what raised the local agreement, not that it's a lot of money. Were there yeah. more veterans or something? Um, a little bit of a raise in the senior center. The value didn't change because the state education tax rate changed. That went a little bit. But the bigger component was we have more veterans exemptions. I think we added three this year. We're up to 32. And those are a $40,000 exemption apiece. So that's a like $1.2 million on the exam value that we have to make up the school tax for. So that, that went from, I think it was around 14,000 last year, and it's 20,000 this year. Thank you. So the veteran exemption is only town? The state doesn't yes. provide one? We exempt the for governor. 40,000 but we have to make up the difference for the school. Hmm. I have a governor that's very pro-veteran right now. Mm -hmm. That is in the state. <laughs> oh, wait, I might have a talk. We should pro-veteran and help the towns out when it does that. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that exemption was done by a vote of the town years ago. Um, you can... Uh, we could change it if we wanted to. 10 to 40,000, and we've done 40,000 for quite some time. Um, and then the state approves the applications for that. We don't have a say in it. I'll move that we approve the tax rates as presented by the Lister's office. A second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All the taxpayers? <laughs> <laughs> all motion taxpayers. carries. Just yeah. reading myself a note. All right, Green Mountain Power line upgrade proposal. Pleasant View Cemetery Trees. See here. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Is that yours? Yes, that's me. I yeah. saw you pull in in that. Kevin, yeah, from Green Mountain Power's here and can answer some questions. You've got a, a map in the packets. You've got a black and white copy here, but you can see the two lines are essentially where the upgraded lines will run. They'll run along the front of the Pleasant View Cemetery. Um, this is part, I mean, Kevin can tell you all the details, but it's part of a larger infrastructure upgrade to improve reliability at, at, yeah. at the most basic level. In order to put these new lines in front of the cemetery, um, we'll have to lose, at one point we thought maybe about three of the trees. Um, I don't know if that's still the case. There could be more than that. The idea would be that if they come out, the amount of power would, would compensate us to replace them. We'd find some kind of similar tree that grew. Um, with the right shape and size to go in where any of the lost trees are. The ones that might be harder to replace just because of the type of tree and position are the ones where the bank's really steep to the road on the southern end. There's a phone line that cuts through it, um, but the others will, will probably look a little more similar. Um, they might be considered shade trees under the Vermont statute, but utilities have an exemption from some of the shade tree process. So we just have to work out at the end of the day if they are shade trees, it just means there's a public hearing before um, they're removed at some point. If they're under the utilities statutory exemption, then there isn't any additional process. So Kevin's here to walk you through the details. We've been on site with them a couple times. Harold and I have. We've talked to Randy Garner a little bit about this back in June. Um, so everybody's sort of aware, understands how it all fits. So it's at this point to see if it's something we're interested in proceeding with and if there's questions or concerns or any of those. Is the quick summary. So, Kevin, when you do the poles, how far from edge of road? At least are 21 the... feet. A minimum 21 feet. Some towns are 21 or 22. Um, and a lot of that down through there, the proposal will be, we're going to rebuild that Pleasant Street sub. And whether or not you all live in Randolph, so probably you're used to your power going out quite frequently. I mean, just in the past few weeks, one of those circuits has been out a couple times. Um, so we're going to rebuild that. And currently, it comes out of the back of the sub, and it parallels the railroad tracks. It's inaccessible. It's old. It's horrible. Um, and it's one of our worst performing circuits, or two circuits, substations in the company. So we want to rebuild that. And this is the one right on the corner, right? The one across from the cemetery? Right. Yeah. In. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That substation. That substation. Right. Currently, there's three circuits that come out of that. So what we would do is bring two of them roadside, 
and come right up in front of uh, New England Precision. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, right? New England right. Precision. Yeah. Right there, we're going to go underground for a stretch of that. Then we're going to come back above ground um, just for one little part right there. And then the phone already exists right along the cemetery. On the northern side of New England Precision, they go up that bank, and we just cross the road there, and we come out over by the Randolph substation by Shaw's. Is it Shaw's or Shaw's, right? Mm -hmm. We come out right there where CB used to have a shop. Right. Uh, so that line would go away, across the field, uh, and we would continue by the subs by the cemetery. So there's there's quite a few trees on that bank where the phone exists right now. Currently, we're not there. Just as you head up the hill. Um, so our proposal would be to remove whatever we needed for trees there for access. And what we would run is we call it spacer cable or Hendrix. It's actually in a diamond shape. You see it up tall and right on the top of the poles. There'd be one circuit on top and one circuit down about six feet. They would go through there. Um, when we get to the cemetery, the, the initial proposal was to cross to the left side of the road if you're headed this way into Randolph. But in order to do that, it makes a real sharp corner. So we have to guide that pole. So I had a stake clear on the back side of the cemetery. But that means that a cable runs all the way across the cemetery. And that wasn't very appealing. Um, so we looked at making that a straight line and just stay right on the right hand side, right down through there. It would be a couple of those uh, trees would have to go. Mm -hmm. And Green Mountain Power would would compensate the town. Uh, our initial offer was two thousand dollars for for any to replant trees, a low growing shade tree. You know, something that's not going to be up in the wires, or if it comes down, it's not going to break the wires, the poles. Um, so for the rest of that line, everything else is going to be essentially a rebuild in place. It's going to be an upgrade. Where it's a single phase line now, it's going to be a three phase line with two circuits on it, but the poles will be in almost exactly the same spot right through town. And it would end at the fire station. So that looks like it crosses back and forth across Pleasant Street. Is that currently go? That's the phone that crosses back over phone and cable? Is that what actually once we're on if you come from, say, New England Precision this way, right, coming up. once we're on the right side, we don't, I don't believe we cross again. I think no, it's probably not you. Right it looks like it's all the way. It's probably telephone and cable that's coming across tracks. the road there, right? Yeah. OK. Yeah. So I'll definitely field any, any questions or, or give you whatever answers I can. If I can't, I'll find them. Well, it's far enough away from anything we might do with water and sewer. Why don't you just put it underground all the way through there? Well, the, you, we have to put these huge cabinets in to splice it underground. Mm -hmm. Like that, we can go from a pole to a pole. And because there's, it's really not that appealing. Uh, it's not that beautiful. Being a main feeder, it's really, really big cable. And it's 4-inch pipe. It's 1,000 MCM is what we're going to do there. 1,000 MCM, we're going to go 700 feet from pole to pole, but we're going to end each circuit on its own pole. So as we come down the road in front of New England Precision, we're going to have two poles right here, and then they're going to go underground from those two, and then on the other end, there's going to be two more poles. So there's actually the same number of poles. It's just they're bunched on this end, and they're bunched on this end. There's nothing in the middle. So if you went underground in each of those green cabinets where you splice, would you have to have two cabinets? Yep. And they're a, the concrete big. wall that they sit on is 14 feet by 7 feet. you got to have two of them. No, you can put the cabinets back to back on those. Yep. But then when we get into that area and we start serving the customers, yeah, customers That's already have, most of them have overhead service. Yeah, they've already got overhead service in there. So, so one of the things that, you know, different ideas that companies come up with with different undergrounds that we do is, well, then we'll go back up a pole and we'll feed them an overhead service. So you still have a pole. The only thing you may not have is wires from pole to pole. Um, and, and that really, if the whole thing went underground, it would probably double the price of the project. 
and it's at uh, almost two million right now. So you have all the same poles. You have the wires yep. going to the houses, and now you got those big ugly green boxes. Yeah. Two of them at each location every 700 feet. Now, while they'd have to be closer than that, where we get into the point where we're serving. Right, because then you got to bring transformers two. up in those locations. Right. You have a lot more than those two ugly green boxes. You have transformers in there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't think yeah. I'm a fan of those. You talked about and, and you're doing you're doing estate. some underground. Excuse me. You're doing some underground. We are. Yeah. Yep. Now, why are you doing that? Well, we can go from pole to pole, um, and that was part of the easement to get the easement across their property. Yep. And I don't know if I really don't know why they're that interested in the underground. We had several different options there, and this was one that uh, that they wanted it. And if we go, if we go stretch it out to 700 feet, then we can get by without having those cabinets. We'll just terminate it on on poles on each end. We do a lot of a lot of things that seem a little odd just to get easements. And, mm -hmm. uh, it gets us away from the railroad tracks, and it's accessible then if it goes down. Uh, Right now, it's it's really small conductor, and the load in Randolph has grown different things, and sometimes just the load will burn the wire down there. So it's definitely a needed, very very needed uh, upgrade. Do you have any questions from the board on the proposal? Anybody in the audience? Does calculus of putting things underground change at all if other parts of the hospital building near the cemetery get dug up? Yeah, I, I understand, you know, some of the expense, but but like, you know, the cemetery, the Maple Street boots out yep. there, and yep. Highland Avenue boots out there, and so does the, does any of that change? If that were all to be dug up, if, yep. if, it, if it was going to all be dug up anyway, does that change anything? No, from this from this overhead structure, we could then go underground. It's not a big deal. And one of the things that we have the hardest time with, and there's a lot of it in that area, is communications, whether it's cable TV, fiber optics, ice media, and that. To get those people on board, in, in all honesty, probably what I'll have to do on this project is find out what size conduits they want. Green Mountain Power will buy the conduit, install the conduit, and then we'll fight to get paid for it. But at least it's in while we're digging. Mm -hmm. and, and then they have no excuse but what to go underground. We have a real hard time. We're pretty proactive on rebuilding these lines and to get these people to come along. Well, you can see it just go down 14 where they installed the new line. You got the chopped off right. holes waiting for the rest of them to come mm -hmm. their stuff. It's Yeah. It's forever. So, and then if you know if we're underground there overhead it lots of times you still have that problem so we have a better chance to get them to transfer if, if we remain the same way we are go overhead it's an easier transition for them all right well it seems like if it helps keep the power on we have less outages i'm all for this it's an upgrade that helps those businesses down. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because we see it now, you know, one side of town's out, the other side's on. That's, that's <laughs> exactly what happens. Highland Avenue can be out and Maple Street can be out. Yeah, no, it's because I know it's where the circuits run, because I see it from my own and perspective on Hull Street. You know, one of the other things, part of this project uh, is just going to be an upgrade, but out of that sub, the 42 and the 43 circuit come this way. The 41 circuit goes back towards the foundry. But what we want to do is rebuild that and then come back up Route 12, yep. mm -hmm. Route 12, and tie it back into that Randolph sub, so that it's a, it's another reliable feed for the hospital. Yep. Right now, the second feed for the hospital goes across that field just above the New England right, position, right, right, right which, behind, yeah, right behind LED, LED, right by LED, and yeah, and that isn't, you know, it looks like it's in the field, but if you spend a lot of time and look at it, it's more right on the edge of the bank in the trees than it is in the field. So, so that line's going to be eliminated across way. the field. It'll just be those guys will just have a service from yep. the other side of the road over to them. And that'll take care of the for three sure. or four businesses over there. Yep. 
Well, I'm all good with it. You want a motion? Yep. Okay, so I'll make a motion to approve the Green Mountain Powers lineup grade as proposed. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And we work out the tree thing Opposed. one way or the other. Something will. Motion yeah. carries. <coughs> Thank you. Well, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Now, now the thing is to try to get conduit ordered for the fall. Good luck. Yeah. By fall. Yeah. 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 So they said 12 week leak time. And that was only for 500 feet. And I need about 5,000 feet. What, si what size is that? Four inch. Four inch. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I've heard all kinds of stories mm -hmm. like that. Not pretty. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. If you have any questions, you can yeah. reach out to Trevor. I think you've got yeah. all my contact info. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank Let's you. Go. Thanks. All right. Current status of Maple Street. I was able to connect with Dubois and King today. Um, one of the last places everything left off was with um, an alternatives analysis. The idea being that it would look at sort of the two way versus one way. There was a quick conversation via Zoom in April to talk through some of the pieces needed to move that forward. Some traffic data that was collected by Two Rivers was passed on, has been reviewed by D and K. Doesn't include, to simplify, it doesn't include turning motions. And so the turning motions are crucial if we want to weigh two-way versus one-way traffic based on um, use of the road. We could always just compare the two options based on construction cost. And what that gets down into answering that question can help determine um, what a construction cost might look like at the end of the day, which and what a scope of work could be for that, and in turn inform a project timeline. So those were the last pieces that were done. I get the impression that COVID and transitions may be way late up until that April check-in. Um, but having not been here for that, it's hard to, to, to say surely. Um, some of the original scope of that 2018 era um, contract we had that contemplated more of the construction has already been done, such as topographic surveys and base map preparation. Uh, there was a preliminary design um, done at that point according to the, to the write-up from the engineer. Um, and then we had sort of ceased in 18 when some of the traffic impact questions came up. Um, there still needs to be coordination on utility companies, though there was some of that if the poles are going to be moved. And then if we revisit any of the um, construction cost scope because it's been about three years. One of the things that's changed are the stormwater rules. So they'll just need to make sure that the newer stormwater rules are incorporated in that as we consider any of the various project aspects. So from here, we can launch towards completing these, this alternatives analysis and that initial scope of work, which gets the construction options, as I understand, were one of the goals to keep moving forward. So we'll probably have to have some conversations about design elements, costs, which of the options at some point. Road widths are one of those questions and how do they play in with the neighborhood designation application and some of the widths that are comp contemplated through that, essentially narrower streets, especially in those neighborhood areas. And so start to put those pieces together. So if we can revive, revitalize this, get this finished up, we can end that one chapter and start to plan for what does a project look like and what's the timeline it moves forward on. So that's the, the quick update. There hasn't been a lot of motion for a while, so this represents most of that motion for, I'd say, all of 2021 to date at some point. Um, from the sounds of it, from what I can, what I got in conversations with DK and looking through some other materials. And all. So it's possible that something else has happened, but didn't come up in that. And so some of that original analysis looked at all the different components. There's water, wastewater, um, different paving options, um, essentially a reclaim and repave, but with some cold planing and some sort of practice called rolling, which I've never encountered, um, but sounded interesting. I don't know if it's in this document. So those pieces would still be part of that, but with updated costs. Do we actually have a document? Not a completed document. This is the technical proposal from the 18 era, 17-18 era RFP. And then we have a contract document from just after that. I don't know if I have it down here with me that lays out some of the deliverables which match this. And I advanced along that timeline with this piece until about 2018 and has essentially 
settled back into the alternatives analysis cost scoping that the update was on just a second ago with the two way versus one way and either needing new traffic counts or just saying that the construction cost will be the metric to weigh the two against each other. So it, there's no sense of if one's better than another. It's just we could forego a additional traffic study. Because when Two Rivers did theirs, they just did the tube style that counted, right. counted sort of the absolute volume. The idea would be to add turning patterns and a few other things to evaluate how that one section would change or what the impact would be if it went from two to one. And but so, my understanding was the first traffic data we got was not great because it showed no trucks. Mm -hmm. And we knew that wasn't accurate. Yeah. They <laughs> so were. they were going to go back and redo it, and they were supposed to do those side streets mm -hmm. also because that data was needed to say mm -hmm. if we went to one way, then they could run it through the traffic model to figure out where the cars would go that wanted to go the opposite way. And yep. then that was the whole discussion of if you went one way, which way do you go? Yeah. Right, because they wanted it coming towards the hospital for ambulance service. Um, but some of the people wanted it going the opposite way, probably because that's what it meant to work. But, you know, it's uh, and that would lead us to the options that were there to have those options to go to the neighborhood meetings to say, here's the board on this one, here's the board on this one. And we had lots of conversations, if I could interject, when we were doing the planning and Marty was part of you know, was, was coming to the neighborhood about this, about like the poles and what it would be like to move the poles and where should the sidewalks go. And, and I think it was pretty universal that moving the sidewalks made a lot more sense than moving the poles. You know, you can go back and ask folks about that, but if you curved the side of the street where the poles were and put the sidewalk on my side of the street, mm -hmm. you know, that might make a great deal more sense economically. Um, it's, and, and I think for the, for the neighborhood, the frustration has been the crickets that have ensued since the traffic, you know, so the, the traffic study was done. The, the one-way versus two-way, the sidewalk width was another option, whether you went with a full with the green space between the road and the sidewalk, or you did the minimum <coughs> width. <coughs> so I don't know that we're ready to go back out to the neighborhood until we get some of that, mm -hmm. because we're what, what my understanding was those, that the RPC was going to do that other traffic study. And I think you're right, COVID hit. And I don't know that they, I, I never saw it come in on one of their reports is one that they had done. So the last one listed is dated in 2019. Yeah. Yeah, the last report back to the board, I think, was made in 2019. That was the last time it appeared in minutes. It might be worth reaching out to them to say, you know, where did this get left off? Because they yeah. get money every year to do traffic studies. Um, and, what, and it's everything from count information to actually running some of it through some models that they have access to. One of the recommendations, rerun it, modeled in synchro, which I'm guessing is a program yep. um, for this type of data. But then I don't know that we've gotten information that gave us the ability to make that decision of one way versus two way and yeah. where to locate what so yeah. as i understand the traffic if you if you wanted that to be part of the decision the getting the right data set would inform the impacts on that and then the cost of construction cost would be modeled based on some of those factors such as where do you start and where do you end that section and then which way it runs up or down, east, west, whatever direction that would be. Um, and some of the, hang on, it's board discussion right. right now. The, um, one of the issues there was if you go to one way, where does that traffic go? Yeah. And so before you could say, you know, because it's such a neighborhood up there, who's going to be impacted and what that impact is, is has got to be known for each of the options. In the scope also, you mentioned the side streets, it was for, for Maple and the two smaller side streets as well were part of the original, okay. part of the um, proposal. Right. Well, I hope sure we can do something pretty soon because I've lived there 
since 1940. And the sidewalks and everything are original. They're historic now, Jack. <laughs> we can We're going to have to go the through the museum. And, they can be <laughs> and you know, I, <laughs> I'm getting old, and I sit a lot on the porch. And I'll tell you, if you'd have been there this summer, you wouldn't have been very happy. But uh, we knew this project at Meanville, uh, so you, you, know, you kind of put up with it. But boy, the tractor trailers and the, the traffic going down there has been awesome. I mean, the, there's, there's nothing left of, of the street. It's just gone. It's gone. And in so, front of where my features is today, I tried to take a walk. You have to walk in the middle of the street, and you have to go like this. In front of a girl that features this house, the storm drain, which has been called in more than once, is totally in now. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a, a liability, and someone's going to get hurt. We have put cones up ourselves, and somebody comes and takes them away. It's probably the town. I don't know. Call me crazy. But we're trying to help people so they don't lose their vehicles or hurt themselves. So we just, we've given up at this point. And I do appreciate, you know, the, the patching that did happen on the road. You know, some of the crater-sized potholes have been filled in, um, which saves me from wanting to build a town for damage to my car when I roll over said potholes. But um, I do not think when you go back and look at this, if you come back and talk with Maple Street, I am not certain that one way or two way was a pivotal issue. It was a design conversation and a thought about how this could work to make a walkable, bikeable neighborhood. But getting the street and the infrastructure under the street fixed, that was the big piece. That's the most important part, is to have a decent sidewalk, to have some protection for our yards so that we are not scooping up two wheelbarrows full of someone else's pieces of road which is what happens after the plow goes through, and that it's safe for people to walk, you know, that, that my mother-in-law can walk from Jocelyn House down to my house, um, you know, which should take five minutes, and now it's just not a safe walk. Mm -hmm. so. so, Trevor, um, one of the other challenges with this project, though, if I understand correctly, is the ability of the water, wastewater fund to afford to redo the infrastructure under the road. So that's a, that's a call, piece. Calling your Congress people without passing that bill. <laughs> <laughs> Not playing that politics. <laughs> no way. There's been a promise there five or six times. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure they'll get this one over the finish line either. So. They listen a lot, but they don't seem to act. Nah. I got some first-hand experience in that. The, the Senate did it, so that, that felt yeah. like a big hurdle to me. But, yeah, but anyway. anyway. All right, well, we'll keep moving um, along with it. So in the next steps are to see where the traffic study is at and mm -hmm. move it towards options. Yeah then neighborhood meetings, preferred alternative. Can, can I ask that you've done such a lovely job starting to communicate about the Bingo Road project. Mm -hmm. Can I ask that that continue about this? Sure. Uh, because that's, that's captured a lot of really good, much more positive feedback than we have had before. Very appreciated. Yeah. OK, Very good. I'm glad it's, that's working. The, are we doing it, the mixture? <laughs> High tech and yeah, front porch corner <laughs> letters right. to my house, and that's yeah. that's the all that all works. Kind of nice to do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, all right, we'll we'll stay with those methods then, and we can Thank certainly you. do that. So, Trevor, being optimistic, when might we expect actual construction to happen? I think sometime in the first half of the 21st century. <laughs> 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 So having, having the foreseeable I've, future. I mean, some of it's going to depend on it, it on the overall scope of the cost. And, and I saw a number from 16, 17 era that had it around a million at that point. And if you had stormwater, wastewater in, I think it's north of that number. It's going to be a, I mean, really some of the time it's going to depend on the ability to pay for the different aspects and how to sequence them. I think water, wastewater could be one of the bigger wrinkles. So if we're able to get 
federal infrastructure dollars. They plug into different pieces. Our paving reserves are healthy. We've built to that. That could be on the earlier end of things, next few years, say. Um, but it's going to depend on, on the availability of funding and the overall cost. I mean, that's really, and then how that measures out with the timing and the priorities and other things that happen. So it'll, it'll be a bit of a Rubik's Cube to actually answer that question. Um, but I think this is the pathway to get to that point to say, here are some reasonable scenarios for when it could if you know these different things fall into place. Namely, when would we have the, the funding for all of the different pieces? Um, so the good scenario would be two or three years, something like that. Have projects of this nature to, to to do everything. They would estimate long, um, particularly if we're looking at federal funding sources, the different commitments, process elements, um, and then the construction calendar I saw in one of the technical proposals I think was about a 16 week so whatever it starts it's a it's a whole summer of, of disruption and uh, um, and everything so it's but that's long-term gain short-term pain for long-term gain in that case but um, well they already learned about that this summer yeah <laughs> yeah we learned about it when Prospect Street was being had the same thing yeah. to it and um, Prospect Street Elm Street you know those are the it's going to tie up some time and takes some time and takes time to get to that phase. Yeah. Well, that's part of it. So we, we knew that going in and considering yeah. the original dig schedule was supposed to be this summer, you know, we were we, we were aware, you know, with those of us that are there. So knowing that it's gonna move forward is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. I think wrapping our hands around what's the full scope and what's the cost is that's the big first challenge really. I mean, it's, figuring out how to pay for it, which is the, ne the next big challenge, but we're on the path to, to yep. do that. And there is money available, so it seems to be more and more. Mm -hmm. It looks Upside like there will be, first. but yeah. It's <laughs> All right, so, uh, I've been in government for 30 plus years, so once they have agreement, which doesn't seem to come very easy to them, then we'll start talking. Mm -hmm. Thank you much. Sure. Next up is a banner installation request. And a discussion about the sign ordinance. So this is <laughs> So in talking with the Map Surrey Music Festival folks, they'd asked for if there was a way they could hang banners in certain places. And what we've included in the packet are um, the, the two pieces from which um, we'll be working through. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, got a copy of the banner. So we've got some folks here from there. So the challenge we're having is that the application form quotes the 1998 version of the sign ordinance and would seem to make more general banner use more permissive, especially on the light pole arms. And that's really where the, the two sets of restrictions come in. When you look at the 2020 version of the sign ordinance in the box that's highlighted, it limits those uses for town events, town sponsored events, or events taking place on town property. And so uh, an event benefiting a school program based on the, the ordinance language wouldn't fit under that town event, town sponsored event, or town property event. What's silent in the sign ordinance, though, is the gazebo as a possible place to, to put a banner. So some of it is just to raise the fact that we've got a, a bit of a discrepancy, and when you think of it from order of operations, to use the, a math term, the ordinance is always going to trump law, ordinance, policy, plan, form, kind of at the at the bottom of that hierarchy. So the ordinance language is the is the operative <coughs> piece. But we could go with and that's what's highlighted in the box. Yep. And so then we could go with the gazebo though, because that's not part of the sign ordinance, and there is some past practice that would indicate that we've made that allowance before for events that aren't town sponsored events. So it would take the light pole arms out but give a, a public place downtown in addition to whatever other efforts. And one of the things I think Josh recommended was um, uh, you know, business windows, bulletin boards, those types of other public advertising spaces as, a, as an augment or an option. So, so when I looked at the town, uh, the sign ordinance though, it doesn't define town a town event. Right. And to me, a town event is bigger than the town did it. It's something that's RACDC. It's chamber, it's the school, it's 
it's some type of entity that's there for the benefit and positive impact of the town. And we don't define it in there. So couldn't the select board say tonight we have determined that a school event is a town event? You could, and then would create that as the, the de facto policy that the definition in the ordinance of town will henceforth be school. And I'm basing it more on sort of the common historical ordinance just the ordinances I've worked on have mm -hmm. been a part of town is more narrowly defined. I think it needs to be rewritten. There's yeah, no doubt about it. So yeah, we, well, that's the, the one takeaway for it. sure, yeah, yeah, is to make sure we have harmony and things get, get yeah. written. Yeah. So from a planning commission standpoint, so the reason the sign ordinance says what it says is because we were trying to, we were focusing on this thing about content neutral. That was like the whole focus mm -hmm. of all this stuff. Yeah. And so I don't really think that the intent here from a planning commission's standpoint was to uh, limit things like, you know, the chambers use these, these lamp post um, rods. The, uh, the, the, uh, the chamber uses them, Chandler uses them, we, the rec departments used them for Fourth of July stuff, and we've also had the chamber use them for Fourth of July, and then you have the whole Christmas wreath thing that hangs on them. So there's a lot of entities, RACDC's used them, mm -hmm. so I don't think we ever thought that this was going to be a problem from a planning commission standpoint, so if we need to clean this up you know, and rewrite that, I think that's what we should do, because in my opinion, we've, now, we've gone backwards here. We're now allowing these things to happen when we're trying to promote these kind of things to happen within the community. So... And where is the event, uh, uh, I have to go back and look at the minutes from when we approved it last month, where is the event going to so be? So that's going to be at Forest Hill. Forest Hill, yep. okay. All right. Which and it's Chandler's benefiting, I understand that it's benefiting students. Is this potentially an exchange program or what? Uh, we have our representative here. Um, Hi. These are the children that were accepted to a very competitive program in the middle school and it got washed away with COVID. Okay. So the parents came forward and asked, um, I'm the advisor, I'm Deb Larry, and they asked if could we continue and can we make it a high school trip. So I said, great, but we have to fundraise and make this happen amongst, and there were 10 and now there's five that are gung-ho and ready to mm -hmm. fundraise to make this happen for their children. And we have from ninth grade to 12th grade, so if Japan is still closed next year, we have four years to ha for this to happen. This event in particular, I've been an advisor for many, many years. I have never seen anything like this. So Tony has made sure community comes first. So the vendors, the uh, far, the far hill, uh, it just everything is Randolph centered. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's what is amazing about this as well. So it's and very much benefiting the community as well as the. the and children. these are Randolph students. Yes. This is Lily Dad. Yeah. Hi. She is a Randolph student. You want to stand and. Really? And she'll be selling her t-shirts that Satomi designed. So it, it's all in-house. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I don't know. My feeling is this falls smack dab under definition of a town event. Well, I'm not sure it's just a school event. Right. Right. From what I'm, you know, this isn't school sponsored. I mean, in right? it's, it's encouraged and we're supported doing it by that. It's a nonprofit, so we're under the. It is a school event. Yes. 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 But, and 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 the young people participating will be, in a sense, representing the town of Randolph. They're too. working hard at this event. So correct. Correct. Yeah. I, and then I, it's also an exchange program because I, for years we've had students have come from Japan. Right. Exactly. So. Exactly. And our, if you allow this, if this is okay, they would be up for two weeks. The, mm -hmm. the event is uh, the 21st. First. And we did talk about that in the Planning Commission, about the length of time the banners could be hung, and I think that part's still pretty appropriate. I think it was about a month or 31 days or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's something, it's in there, right? No more than 31 days yeah. and removed within seven hours. Right. Yeah. right. So is this part of the sister... Yes and no. Because that's children a town. were accepted oh, yeah. for that middle school, and because COVID hit, they, it was canceled. Mm -hmm. And these are just motivated parents who came forward and said, please, can we make this happen for our children? But our children will be in high school. Right. But isn't, is the, where they're going, isn't that, like, that's so, the 
right. municipality that the town has the sister relationship with, right. correct? So we may visit them. We have a sort of a new goal with the environmental um, disasters that happen in Japan. We are focusing on where the tsunami hit, because this is the year, the 10th year anniversary of the tsunami for them. And we were um, working on getting a monument and bringing it to them and, and expressing, uh, commemorating the lives that were lost and establishing a high school relationship. Because we don't have a sister school with high school. We only have a sister school with middle school. Mm. So that's what we're trying to support, our new goal. Um, some, something in regard to the 10th anniversary of the tsunami, from a Vermont perspective, it's also the 10th anniversary of Irene. Is it? Yeah. Uh, in a week and a two weeks. So yes. that could be a nice... A bridge. A, a, you know, we, we've both been through pretty significant national, national disasters yes. 10 years ago. So. Yeah. Or in our case, a natural disaster. In their case, a yes. man-made disaster. Uh, sure. Impacted by a natural disaster, I guess. Good way to put it. Anybody want to make a motion that it's a town event? I, I would maybe leave it more generic to say that you're going to approve the banner permit, set the policy that way. I think if we designate it a town event, we just want to make sure that we're not creating an insurance obligation or anything like that. Um, as an, as a, an event owner and event sponsor, so you'd be approving the ability to use it under the definition that it we're under the premise that it meets those definitions. I don't know that you'd want to designate it one without us maybe doing that piece, if that makes sense as a way to, mm -hmm. yeah. if where you're headed is toward approval. And then one of the things we'll have to make sure, and it's, I don't want anybody to confuse us with a lack of support from the building. It's just, if we've got some policy goals and the ordinance is the way we want to achieve them, we're just going to make sure that gonna, that language, language. Yeah, this just toss language. it back to yeah. the planning commission. Yeah, yeah. these what? things all have to match our, our vision and our intent, and, and so right now they don't, so we just have to figure out how to navigate right. through the, the confusion, okay. I think, rests in, you, you know, you've got town events, comma, town sponsored events. Well, what's, yeah. right. well, it what's the difference? Yeah, I don't, yeah, right. I guess the intent was not to limit these kind of things going forward. I don't think we really gave it a thought that we would be limiting anybody's ability to use those. It took a new set of eyes to find that for us. Yeah, no, it's actually <laughs> it's great that these guys <laughs> are doing this because we might not have discovered this until the next chamber event or the next RACDC event. So, you know, I'm happy to deal with it right now and see if we can get it fixed. All right, we got a motion on that? Somebody. I'll move we approve the um, use of, uh, the, uh, under the terms of the banner ordinance that we approve uh, that the Missouri uh, Music Festival is able to use um, public locations for putting up banners for the upcoming event. Is that correct? Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so the uh, paving bids uh, came in and we dealt with them via email. We just need to ratify the it left. to go with the Springfield Son of the Paving. A motion that we approve uh, Springfield Sunapee paving to do um, paving on the three roads this year based on their bid. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Can I ask a question just for clarification? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, is this going to be the full length of Weston Street? It is. And then just that section at the top of School Street. Yeah, above where the railroad track. crosses the rail tracks down to that yeah, yeah. first yeah. speed hump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one where I often fear my car is going to disappear. Um, so go quicker. You'll jump it. Well, the speed hump is there so you can yeah, <laughs> That's so you true. Can jump you can do, it. Yeah, we yeah, we yeah, give like, you an alternative. What's that? The French connection. <laughs> <laughs> And don't, we should have a don't try to beat the train. <laughs> there should be a schedule on that soon. When Morgan talked to him, it sounded like they were trying to maybe time our work with work in Bethel. So they moved the equipment up this way one time. Mm -hmm. we're, we're owed that schedule answer. Uh -huh. If they ever stop working in Bethel. 
<laughs> All right, next up we have an easement request from Jack Cowdery. This is, you got a, a map in the packet, it's a little hard to see in black and white, but it shows essentially this would formalize, uh, create a formal easement for access to that part of the property at 4 Central Street. The drive's currently in use, it comes across that sliver of town-owned land next to the village fire station. Um, this would... It's the little triangle. Yeah, yeah, we, we sort of, I just drew the box around it to kind of show what the approximate area would be. Really, it's right. this little triangle that they, where they cross. And these lines are not obviously exact, but give you a sense of where it would be. Mm -hmm. um, it's in use now. The easement includes a prohibition on parking or blocking the easement as part of the access so that we don't get any conflicts with emergency vehicles um, exiting the building in particular. Um, but this is, how long has that driveway been in use, Jack? <laughs> Since the 40s. According to my original deed, I own the first bay of the, first, of the fire station. <laughs> Oops. Well, you that's okay. You sell them here, there. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. You can't do that now. Well, you have to get a first class license from it. Yeah, you gotta, get a, you gotta give me a license. You don't sell it, you put it in the soda machine. Yeah, there you go. And, and so you've got a, a draft easement here. Mike Tarrant has looked at it. Um, and his feedback is incorporated, namely in the form of the no parking or blocking part of that. Um, so it's been reviewed by the town attorney as well. So just a question on this. Usually there's a fee or something that goes along with these, but I would assume when we get onto the Maple Street project, if we need an easement onto some of your property, we'll get it for nothing like we're doing this one for nothing. I knew you were here. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> I was gonna like, okay, what are we going to trade here? <laughs> What's the deal? Hey. What's the deal? First round draft choice in 2024. <laughs> yeah, player to be named later. And the only other update we'll have to make is East Stage July 2021, so it's a small when it's signs okay. get updated little, to August. If you, if you, presuming you're You approved. can fix that. Yeah. All right. Just something I wanted to get cleared up. It's, um, it's, I've got a sales agreement, it's ready to go. Sounds good. Tom. So there'll be an equal trade, though, when we're doing the Maple Street project, correct? <laughs> this is, you this heard is that, right? She said she's hard. I said, no. <laughs> she hasn't changed any in 20 years. <laughs> it's been longer than that, Jack. <laughs> sure it is. <laughs> Right. But I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking the town for an easement across our property, and in a few months, we will be coming to you potentially asking for an easement on your property if it, if that option comes out there. I'm just saying. Well, you know, I, I look at it this way here when it comes to uh, Maple Street. Uh, that's a pretty tight situation down through there, especially on the, on the eastern uh, part. And boy, I'll tell you what, you, you start squeezing, and I'm, I, I think in all reality, it's going to be so much easier to make that a one way because by the time you, you make a five foot uh, sidewalk and then two lanes of highway, you're going to be right into my flower bed. Mm -hmm. So, but we'll, <laughs> hey, we'll have to cross that bridge when the time comes. You notice I don't drive my trucks down here while the road's been detoured, right? You oh, haven't oh, seen my trucks on no, that street at all, right? Yeah. I'm trying to help you guys out. I heard there's a lot of complaints up there, so I'm not on that road. But it, it, it's going to be a it's going to be a problem. But hey, just like everything else, you have to work it up. Yeah. And we will. I think that was a yes. <laughs> well, I want it on the record. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that was a qualified. Yeah. Um, There's been no commitment. I, no, no. I would just go on the record as saying that if it's going to be one way, I think ambulances trump commuting to work. But, yes. Uh, yeah. Maybe. Definitely. But, but we're back to this. Yeah. So I'll assume if we approve this tonight and give you the easement into there, we'll get the same treatment when that road. Maybe you maybe maybe you won't need it. Maybe, maybe you won't we need won't. it. Life will be good, right? Well, I don't really need this, <laughs> honestly. You know, if you really want to look at it, no. I don't need it because I've been using it for yeah. 40 years, okay? Right. And it can't be taken away. But I, I try to do things right and get this done. Mm -hmm. And and I, I will say, I will do the best I can to make this thing work up on Main Street. 
Okay. There you go. You got it. We got it. I'll give you my word. I'll make a motion to approve the Z. We'll come talk about it on your day. Second. I'd second it. You're good. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? Thank you, oh, ladies Harry. and gentlemen. You knew you were going to get harassed. Right? Oh, I know. Yeah. Jack, but I Jack. didn't guess that. He would not like it if he didn't. Jack, <laughs> she's getting tougher. <laughs> Jack, you said you start, you do things right. When did you start that? Food. <laughs> 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 Always been at that. I learned it all. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Villanova. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Next up is authorizing an application for neighborhood development area designation. So we're coming up on an application deadline. I believe it's at the end of the month. You've got a narrative in there from Josh. You can't join us. He's deep in the Groton State Forest this week. Um, so essentially the action item would be authorization to apply for our neighborhood designation, our neighborhood development area designation from the downtown development board. The application is underway. We're hopeful the authorization to apply is enough to satisfy the state agency involved. Um, if for some reason, I guess there is some question about whether they need you to bless the full formal application once it's done. So if that's something that does need to occur, that might have to be pulling three of you together if you authorize it tonight just to give a formal blessing to the application at some point before the deadline. I want to say it's the 27th, but I didn't write it down, and I apologize mm -hmm. for that. Um, you've got a map in the packet. It's a little hard to see in the black and white version. Um, there's really sort of two areas on, on either side of, uh, of the downtown area, um, and one up off the sort of Elm Street and uh, Forest Hill area, the other one down here incorporating uh, parts of Weston School and then over on on Hospital Hill would be the that would be our neighborhood development area separate from our downtown designation area and then there's a list of benefits in there so qualified mixed income projects would be exempt from Act 250 um, if they're not exempt or any Act 250 projects not qualifying for an exemption would get a 50 percent discount on application fees fees for wastewater review are capped at 50 bucks um, exemption from the land gains tax, limitation on appeals of conditional use permits for residential development, and uh, priority consideration for state grants. Uh, it takes into consideration things like floodways, floodplains, some of the less developable or undevelopable properties as well, is how you get into that. And then as Josh writes, the National Historic District around Depot Square um, is taken into consideration as well. So this fits in with some of these zoning changes that were approved in July, were done in anticipation of potential NDA designation at some point later on. So this keeps that process moving forward. And so we'd apply for that and then there'd be a presentation round in, in the fall. Go before the downtown development board. Some of the wrinkles that we'll have to work out along the way, um, if we get through sort of what designation would look like, might pertain to sidewalk project timing and or what constitutes a level of applicable commitment. Obviously, we're not looking to commit to sidewalk projects that haven't been scoped identified, but might be nice to connect to different areas. Um, and so we just have to figure out what that commitment means because it does come with that for projects such as Salisbury Square and potentially some of our missing link segments as we think of them. So over um, Park Street, had, there's a missing link up to the uh, to the rec field, and then here in the village, when you kind of cross the railroad tracks and around there, uh, down Weston Street. Yeah. yeah. That's it's interesting. There is a sidewalk on Western Street. It's just all grass and grown over. Yeah, it, yeah. And so some of there are some. I never knew it was there until I fixed my driveway and found that. Hey, look at this. There's a concrete sideway right here. <laughs> I'm not getting it. It's all grown over. Yeah. So this would be the authorization. Uh, authorization to apply would be the action item tonight. Trevor, I'm yeah. having trouble reading this, Matt. Yeah. yeah. Um, does that that include Salisbury Square and Branchwood? Uh, yes. Let me see if I can. You got the color one right here. No, I can't. Yeah. I can't parse this map. It, it, yes, I believe. Let me just see if I can find real quick. I'm going to show you. It's an imperfect way to do it, but at least get you going. 
These are all parcels, right? Yeah. yeah. So, Salisbury Square, yes. Branchwood parcel, too. And it looks like Branchwood would yes. be, too, based on yeah. what I'm reading as the railroad track and where it goes past that property. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that would be part of the goal. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you can if you look at it on this one, but Tom's probably Tom's there. Yeah. yeah, so the railroad track is. Think of it as the sort of that dividing little space between the, the thicker the thicker blue space yeah yes. between yeah. between the blue and the and the yellow in that section Got it. Yeah. yeah okay so yes those both are included i'll move that we submit an application for the nda and i will second it and the second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have a Borac grant. Then you've got a, a, a narrative from Josh. The timing considerations are similar, and that there's an end of the month or impending application deadline. This would be tied to a Borac grant for the um, Fellow Mont Trail be a multi municipality project, so Braintree, Randolph, and Rochester, much like we were on prior board grants, we'd be the, the lead applicant. Um, and so this would be part of that Velo Mont Trail, which is going to go I think, hopefully the whole length of the state of Vermont and have a, a hut system along with it. Um, so there's a couple of huts that come with two to three signage, eight to ten miles of new trail, marketing plan, and the way the Velo Mont Trail is currently proposed it will come through downtown I believe as it comes up sort of out right. come through downtown back up toward the Ellis lot and partially somewhere up there kind of skirt its way back up and along the trail and there's even been some talk about trying to figure out if there's a way to put a, a hut essentially down here in downtown either something built or something repurposed downtown or close to downtown yeah mm -hmm. which would be nice so that we can take advantage of some of that that trip based traffic uh, it's like a cabin type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's different versions yeah, of that. There's right. there's yeah. cabins, there's yurts, um, so there, and there's some glamping type units that are popping up into these regions, and so there's things that are happening off off from off the trail, which is actually creating some economic activity that's being planned. Where there's actually maybe not just from the huts association, but some private landowners through hip camp and some of those things. That are near to those spaces, creating the same type of thing. Is there a match on this grant? It doesn't. There's not one listed. I can see if I can find that. Really. I don't think there was. I didn't think so, but I didn't want to promise that. The first one was there. I not remember. I don't remember if there was a match on the first one. If there was. It might be an in-kind style match. Oh, it may have been. And if it's like the first one, I think we can recoup some of our administrative costs as well. Yeah, it does say that in there. Does it say that in there? Yeah. yeah. Match can be any. Where's the match? Match for that would come out of recreation. Yeah, our matching there. funds required. This is from the state. No, a match is not required. It demonstrates your project readiness and leverage capacity at the local level, but it can be any type of funding source or in-kind service, donated materials, as long as they're related to budgeted eligible expenses in your project scope. Yeah. yeah. I like those grants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those are the best kind, yeah. <laughs> My understanding is that we're the only ones that actually completed that. You are 100% yeah. right. Yeah. We're the only town that actually, I mean, it was awarded to Jay, to Jay Gut. Okay, Jay got a chunk of money, right? Newport. Or Newport, Newport, or Newport region? Yeah. yeah, Newport, I think. And yes, they ran into some issues with permitting and something. Yeah. I don't know. So we're the only ones that completed it. Permitting yeah. problems? No. Where would those come from, Perry? I didn't believe it. <laughs> so, anyways, yeah. So I'm kind of excited to see if we can put something together for this one. So it's a neat, Is it's a, a neat project. For yeah, sure. that's a motion. <clears throat> I'll make a motion that we. Uh, Approve their application request for a vote for the um, for a grant. And I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 
draft ARPA funding committee and scope of work proposal. This is something we talked about at the last meeting to put together a, a draft version of that idea. Um, we did get the first of our two payments of the base money on Monday. So the 239.944 is, is with us in a safe space um, and arrived by a direct deposit. The $120 million in county funds are going to be repurposed for local governments. We don't know details on timing or amount, but the easiest way would, because we've all certified, the easiest way would be to split it in half like the other funds and deliver it by direct deposit. <laughs> we'll see. Nothing about the county funds has been easy so far, so we'll see, we'll see if suddenly it shifts. That, that actually could amount to, if you prorated across municipalities, that's a lot more money, right? Yeah, at one point they're talking about a per capita share, and if, yeah. if you do that, you boost that 480 that we would be expecting goes up north of, of of the six digit, oh, uh -huh. I think it gets you just to over around a million dollars yeah. in a very conservative estimate, but it's right, right, because that's such a big jump. We've really hesitated even <laughs> sort of guessing what the amount would be until they put it. I looked the other day, I didn't check today, but I looked the other day, they hadn't kind of updated those back in February or March. There might have been a number hanging out there because at one point they did publicize it because other municipalities made decisions based on expecting and anticipation. Amount. Wow. Yeah, and then suddenly got 40% of what they were expecting, or 20% or because it was half of the 40. Um, so the other half of the money, however they split it out, will come next May, June is, is the thought. So we've got some time before we've got all of the funds. The uses haven't changed from what we've talked about in terms of the, the categories. So we'll be trying to figure out for now how to navigate within those. Whether it's VLCT or the National League of Cities or others, they've, they've encouraged folks to look at a strategic planning and community engagement process. One easy way to do that would be sort of a multidisciplinary, multi-jurisdictional kind of committee that includes board and committee members and public members that would work with town staff, probably primarily through the manager's office to, to figure out what the guidelines are, um, to figure out what community priority, priorities are, to, to engage uh, the community at different spots, um, stakeholders, potential partners. And then to maybe create a, a master list of at least some project ideas that would be eligible that are out there. And then include any information we've got about them. Some of them might just be, yep, that's an eligible use. We have no idea cost, scope, timing. And that would have to be developed at a later point. But at least to give us some sense of here are some of the ways that this money could be used so that when the, the board and the voters, when we get into that process of figuring out how to spend it, we've done kind of an engagement exercise. Everybody knows that we've got the money. They know what it's for. The, Infrastructure is water, wastewater, broadband, not um, some of the other facility-based needs that have that have come up. This potential. Oh, sorry, say, say that again. Infrastructure is what? Water, wastewater, and broadband. You can use it on other infrastructure up to a certain amount if you can tie it to any lost revenue. Um, so when we've seen right. communities paving with the money, for example, it's been through that lost revenue provision. Mm -hmm. um, I think Montpelier is an example of that. Some of it was redirected there, but it went lost revenue in up to that max. And I forget what it is, 15% of the award amount. Or Not that like I'm that. suggesting this, but could a, uh, a portion of it be used towards something like Maple Street? Um, Would that fall within? On a basic understanding of the water, wastewater, and you can consider stormwater, wastewater, you, you could probably make that yeah. case. Yeah, yeah, the funds are trying to be tied to, to COVID impacts or public health, and so I think that's why they've limited to those infrastructure categories. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing to keep in mind, Tom, is the money is to the town of Randolph. Right. And the water wastewater is a separate yeah. district. Right, right. So you've got to balance and, and, well, that and I also somehow, was too. Coincident with that, I was going to point out that in the, in the suggestion that we form a committee and making sure it has town-wide representation, that's right yeah. in, that, in that ballpark. So, yeah. 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 I thought clean water and whatnot was there, too, which would address some of our culverts and yeah. ditching and all that. I think the stormwater through the clean water hook might be, and it, it seems like in a state like Vermont, that's if you apply it to include all those projects, you could get into to culvert and those types of water quality projects. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to flush that out because we might be able to really accelerate that program if that were a, a, a use that, that was eligible and people were interested in. And that, and that would have town-wide benefit. We've got culverts all over the place and small bridges and other things. That, that are washing roads out. Yeah. Yeah. And so the idea would be we'd 
flesh out a scope of work. We'd be in, uh, I propose a nine member committee. This is based on uh, the size of a group I worked with at a prior stop on a project that had some elements about sensitive to, to geographic locations, representation, and then um, putting about half the committee membership would be from boards, committees, and commissions, so we create a connection point to the different areas of interest. Um, having it led by the policy and legislative body, I think, was something that I would recommend, and that's in there. Um, so there'd be a board member. I've listed some potential committees, but you could um, move them around. Some of the, the ones I picked, I just because of some of the ties to the eligible uses um, for potential projects we've got. So we've got budget, capital advisory, energy, and economic development. You could slide planning commission in there as well, or in lieu of one of those, um, with four committee slots at this point being held for public participation. So we would solicit membership, but look to a point with an eye towards one of the members is in the village, one's in Randolph Center, one's in East Randolph to ensure that we've covered everybody. And if you did four, that leaves a sort of a wild card member in there as well. It could be from somewhere in town. Any anywhere inside there. Maybe the chairs of those committees you mentioned? Could be the players? Could be the chairs or if there's a committee member that or, has a particular interest or, yeah. or a skill set that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, you know that that could be could be that. And so if the idea is okay as the way to engage, as a way to start to figure out how to, what the eligible uses are to dig into this a little more, we've got time. We don't have to obligate the money till 2024. We don't have to spend it till 2026. Um, but with our budget cycles, if we're gonna loop it through that, we don't have quite as much time because we have to be thinking ahead a little bit in terms of we're gonna start building fiscal 23. So fiscal 24 comes kind of on the on the heels. So we need to be in 2023, have that you know, for, for town meeting 2023 if it needs to route through a, a budget or if that's what we want to do. There's no limitation on when we can start spending it, though, right? No, we could we could I go mean, tomorrow. Say this group identified yeah. something imminent. Yeah. Then okay. Yeah, and provided we have the right other types of process, we could go sooner than later. Mm -hmm. So that Montpelier example, the paving funds came, you know, they, they dedicated them to go back out before they had them on the basis of lost revenue replaced up to a certain amount, so it's eligible for this type mm -hmm. of use, and mm -hmm. we're going to dedicate that to, I forget what the paving project was, not near my house. Um, mm -hmm. The pavement near my house is actually pretty good, so I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> the only problem would be if they used it for something that turned out to be in my own because they did it too quickly. And that's the other thing, well, the nice with the slow approach is we get yeah. to see both what's successful, what's creative, mm -hmm. what the interpretations are yeah, for the uses. Yeah, yeah. And we also get to see the ones that maybe don't work out. And so we know to steer wide yeah, um, yeah. around some of those. So it gives us a little time to collect a little more of that kind of yeah. data. I mean, it's not directly analogous, but you could get yourself in a TIF type yeah. situation after the fact and wind up holding the bag for yeah. Sizable amount of money. So. Yeah, suddenly you're locally responsible for funding money you thought would be eligible for this other use of funds where they have to repay them or it's ineligible. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so, so taking a bit of a slow walk on it does make some sense just to make sure we use it right. And we don't have all of it until right. next June anyway. I'm under the idea that, you know, let's just set the group up, mm -hmm. start thinking about it, start brainstorming. Don't get in a big hurry because the program's probably going to change. That's, I'm, I'm just yeah. sharing with you. My personal experience is some things right right now with the SBA that's like, oh, that wasn't eligible, and now you can do this. That's you know, a, this just all happened last week. Yeah, yeah. that's a bet I would not take because I I think you're absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I think you right can see now. this change. Yeah. yeah. So you know whether stuff becomes a little more lean. I mean, that's what's happened now is some of the some of the qualifying expenses are now. <clears throat> there's others that you couldn't do six months ago or a year ago. So things are changing, and they're probably rebooting this. <laughs> Well, we had a smaller version of that where we had, at some point along the way, had applied for reimbursement for COVID-related expenses, and FEMA had turned it down at the time, and it was later reviewed, and these expenses were deemed eligible, so $19,000 came back to the town recently that had at one point been denied under an interpretation of a set of the rules that when it was re revisited, right? oh, no, wait, these are eligible. We're going to yeah. um, separate pot of money, but still... You know, received it. They're changing the yeah. uses or they're changing how they're allocating it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a great idea. We can get started on setting up a group and start brainstorming. Yeah. We'll put together a full formal yeah. scope that builds off of the bullets there. And there's some other um, 
things to consider, best practice stuff from some of those groups that I mentioned and uh, that we can pull together and uh, get this group to engage and do some of the heavy lifting of figuring out how to navigate the pathways and then leave some of the decision making in terms of how the money gets spent for, for a second phase this might be the way to, to think about it whenever that might be. Thank you for taking the initiative. Yeah. It's a, this is a nice problem to have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, how to spend a million dollars. Yeah. How are we going to spend money we didn't count on? <laughs> Right. I could use that kind of problem more often. Yeah, I would have that one in for sure. All right, let's move on to consider authorizing replacement of the Pearl Street well pump. And I think, I don't know if you jumped on Zoom, if Chris is with us remotely, Chris Chambers. Yeah, up there. Is he? Mm -hmm. So, Chris, if you want to. I can do a little intro, but you're going to have more of the color, I think, in terms in the detail. Can you hear me all? Yeah, we'll we'll turn you up a little bit. We got some speakers going, but we can hear you. Okay. Um, Second. Yeah. So we had the Pearl Street well pumping rates have declined um, a little bit this summer, and. For the last time they declined, it turned out to be pumped well or clogged well screens, had full pump, and cleaning the screen. Um, that was done in roughly 2004, 2005, um, but the pump was not replaced. And this is the same pump that's been in there since the mid to late 80s. Um, so, my thought process was that we're going to pull it again, probably about to, to replace the pump. Um, normally, I think this would be kind of a no-brainer for everybody, but considering that within a year and a half or so, um, this pump, this well is going to become a backup, I felt it should, you know, it needed further discussion. Um, and on top of that, the Parco valve, which prevents the pump from water hammering when it turns on and off, um, you cannot find parts for it anymore. Um, I did find out last week that there's a technician that repairs these, but he, he has come up with creative ways to fix them alternatively. Um, so the current method uh, instead of a Parco valve is to use a variable frequency drive which allows a soft start and shut off of the pump um, to keep it from slamming and water hammering on the system, but it also does it in a safe manner that the, doesn't hurt the intricate parts of the pump. Overall, it prolongs um, well pump life as well. And so, Chris, did you want to, if one of the other options would be essentially a manual valve? that staff would have to go and turn on and off every day, right? And clo open the valve, close the valve. Right. When the pump was in, if we were operating the pump, we'd have to have a valve that we'd go and manually open and close instead of the Parco valve. Um, the um, issue with that could be is the amount of pressure that's on it. We could look at that, you know, the valve may not be easily opened. Um, they were trying to look and see if there was a type of gear ratio valve um, to do that. Um, I know that they, they hadn't gotten back to me on whether there was such a thing or not yet. I know on our slide gates at the wastewater plant, we have a special gearbox to assist with a, a similar situation. And those gearboxes are 800 to $1,000 just for the gearbox, but it's not on a valve, it's on an actual slide gate. So it could be very different and a very different mechanism for an opening and closing of a butter, uh, gate valve. Chris, what's the cost of the new pump and the, the variable frequency drive? So, um, I originally wasn't planning on being at the or attending the meeting at all tonight, so I don't have numbers in front of me. I got them for um, you. 
Okay, I'll let the driver take that part. So it works out to between the, the two pieces. We got you, Chris. Um, we got the two pieces. Uh, it would be the total would be about thirty-two thousand five hundred. It's split almost fifty-fifty. There's about seventeen thousand dollars for the pump and about sixteen thousand dollars for the um, for the variable frequency drive. And then there's the potential with the VFD. These are the types of things that have been eligible for efficiency Vermont rebates because they're so much more efficient. So we can probably we weren't able to determine a full cost of that today, but we can probably um, lower the VFD cost if that program's still there, still accessible. Um, and, and we'll try to utilize it again with the North Reservoir project, for example. Um, so there's the possible possibility that we can add some, some extra relief in there. And both of those for the, are for the installed pieces. It would be two separate uh, vendors, right, Chris? It would be Vermont Well and Pump would do the install for the well pump piece. And then Weston and Sampson would do the install and supply the variable frequency drive. That is correct. Now we did try to calculate today the staff cost of going out over the course of a year to turn a valve on and off manually. So even if you assume it's an hour a day um, and you include all the incidentals, the number Cliff and I came up with is, is about $10,000 a year to send an operator out to do, an op yeah. to, to do that provided they could still um, do that without any some of the, the pressure things. So there's a um, there's certainly a benefit for that, knowing that this emergency source will continue to run and run efficiently without without requiring us to to, to schedule that in. Can you explain the two parts again? One is the pump. Yep. And the other is installation, or is it something else? Well, there's the well pump and installation is the one piece, and then the other piece is the variable frequency drive, which has its own installation piece. It's separate too. from separate, the Separate, yeah. Okay. And, and, the, and the drive basically, Chris, just opens and closes the valve, right? In, in the simplest, um, ter simplest form? Yeah. It, yeah, it just basically turns the pump on, and then the check valve, which are already in place, um, would you know, the pump then would you, know, you wouldn't get the water hammer on the system and you'd utilize the check valves that are already there that prevent water from running back into the well pump as it is the parco valves just to make sure the pressure you know you don't get a bunch of water hammers and break stuff throughout the system and cliff described the cost as this will not hit the budget balance sheet items, so we're really talking about cash versus budgetary concerns, and the town has the cash to do this. Does the water wastewater committee have the cash to do that? The town isn't the one paying for it, they are. Right. If I understood correctly, this would be out of that general one account pool of cash, it would be probably easiest to think of as town pool, and then we'd have to make sure it's allocated screwed up at some point so that it is enterprise fun. But I think if I understood this when we talked about it this afternoon, it's, it's out of that general pool of town cash and not a water, wastewater specific one. Looking for my notes here. But it would get allocated to them? Not if they don't have the money. It gives back into where they already owe the general fund a fair chunk. It could create a do to do from mm -hmm. situation that needs to be trued up at, at some point, depending on how how we sort it through it. But at the simplest level, that might be one way to do it. And it, yeah, maybe the. How far down is the pump? Okay. Well, I um, uh, roughly 160 feet. Oh, that's uh, all? That's it? I thought that one was deeper. <coughs> Uh. I've gotten varying numbers. Vermont Well and Pump is going on the last one to pull it. They have 160 feet on their record at, okay. from when they pulled it in 05 or 04, whichever. So if they pull it 160 feet and it's the screen that just needs to be cleaned and have it sent back down, that's not that big a pull. So um, just so you're aware, the the, this pump, it's a 50 horse pump, and the piping to it, it's not like you're piping in your standard homeowner's pump. Right. It's all steel piping all the way down yeah. through. So as they pull it, they have to take it apart 
and then they have to put it all back together to send it back down through. Okay. Well, but there's no money in the water wastewater budget to, to pay it. Is that the? Let me see if I can <laughs> verify that, one, that. Well, I guess we know the answer to Maple Street, then, don't we? <laughs> I think we're starting from closer to the floor than the ceiling. I don't ever see us abandoning that well, even though that's the well that gives us the trouble. Because when we were at that meeting in Montpelier, mm -hmm. that that well is the that, that's the well that supports the fire system. Even if the other ones go online, that was always the, the plan, right? That we needed that volume in yeah. case there was a spike to our, for a local village fire. <clears throat> so. Or if you have a dry year. Well, that's true, right? So yes, as, I think you need it. I just yeah, I, I don't think they, I don't see us getting it. rid of it. So, if the last one lasted forty years, I'm not considering that to be too bad an investment. <laughs> I don't know what the last one cost, but it, you know, that's who knows, point. right? Yeah, forty, and we're assuming this has a thirty-year useful life, Chris. Oh, sorry, my phone's beeping at me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably about a 30 year useful life. Or we, do we not? Maybe not know. Who and I were talking about? I'm getting. Um, unfortunately, prior to you know the mid 2000s, some of our records within my department aren't that great. Um, but yeah, that's from what I'm you know getting from because. Um, Aaron Perez was the superintendent at the time, and he had no information saying as to when the last time was, the pump was pulled, when he pulled it. And um, all indications lead to that being the pump that was um, done mid to late 80s. Mm -hmm. There's some uh, note here that the expense hits the the budget on the capital site over a 30 year period. So the idea would be that that's where it would show up in the water, wastewater capital side and be depreciated over that 30 year period. Okay. I'm understanding my own handwriting, of course. That makes so that sense. makes it a 30 year asset, but that still doesn't address how it gets paid for. Yeah. Right. Your question still. It would be, well, it would be, as this sits, it would be out of the general town account sort of pool of okay, but then it's got to have a payback schedule it would then have to be assigned yeah if we wanted to but, yeah i mean the cash piece would be town and the budget piece is how we assign it okay you know we there's been a fair amount of heated discussion over the correction that's taking place now in a couple of town meetings oh, to, to reconcile some of those due to due firms between the accounts there's a transaction i think it takes place every year right now to pay back the general fund from the from them right just is it there's sewer Twenty five thousand yeah. from sewer. water mm -hmm. and it usually flows no pun intended from the enterprise to the to the general and i really didn't i have to <laughs> <laughs> But that's how I've seen it show up, is that it's a, the enterprise fund making the general fund whole for whatever reason, however that obligation occurs. It was a project that was done and they weren't charged for their part of it. So. That's a common way, yeah. Or costs get assigned to their own place or paid out of their own place or mm -hmm. usually project related. So is the the pump is just slower right now, correct? The volumes are lower. It's not not functioning. It's just functioning at a lower capacity. It's, is that right, Chris? It's functioning at a lower capacity, but it, but it did stop functioning, right, recently? When it stopped functioning, we had a control issue. But oh, um, yes, it has been functioning at a slower rate. It usually pumps about 275 to 280 gallons a minute um, and it's 
currently at two, roughly two thirty range. Um, like if it don't know if it's the well screen or if it's the winding starting to go bad. It's it's one of those things that you can't tell until it's out of the ground. Um, just wanted to add that it, last year when, the, when we were so dry at the end of last summer, um, the pinnacle wells, we had two of them that we shut off because they were getting, they were starting to pump below their permitted rates. And then two of the others were showing, their, the other two were showing signs of struggling a little bit. So we actually ran for much of the month of August on the Pearl Street well alone, and it never wavered on its pumping rates while the other wells were showing signs of drought issues. Um, just so that everyone's aware, and that just shows how good that pump is, or that well is, I should say. Mm -hmm. Chris, what would the plan be to take that pump out and look at it and make a decision at that point? and have the new pump on hand? Or what would the procedure be? So we're looking at um, six weeks lead time to get the replacement pump, much like everything else in the country. You know, everything's on major backwater. Um, so that's kind of one of the kickers right now is, you know, it may either have to order it and have it, and then I'm not sure. I'd have to chat with the contractor about that to see what, you know, what kind of predicament that puts them in. Is it possible to come back with next month with a more complete knowledge? Of I think yeah. we got to get it on order. You got to move this because otherwise you you're going to be into winter here, and then you're going to be dealing true. with it cold weather. I'm wondering if we can't authorize them to order it and have Cliff come back to us with the cost and how it gets paid how he for. Gets, yeah, I think I'm more inclined to figure that. Yeah. And I think they, we got to be very transparent if we're taking money from the mm -hmm. general fund to fund something there so the non-participants in that fund are right. heard out again. Read. <laughs> I think it has to be that we authorize them to order the pump. Yeah, I think with it's a plan authorizing. coming back next month from Cliff on how to pay for it. It's okay, me. what Trini said, I'd move. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Cheater. Sorry. Perry moved what Trini said. That's right. And I'll, I'll second. Tom, Tom said. I'll, I'll second, second what Trini said. I'll second what Perry said, Trini said. Yeah, yeah. Here comes the telephone game. <laughs> and I've seen a lot of jokes lately about when we get older and our hearing's not as good, what we heard and what the next person heard. It's mm -hmm. pretty funny. Yeah. All right. We have a motion to a second on the table. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have a water allocation for 131 Sugar Plum Court. Would be for a three bedroom home for $954. Recommended for approval by the Water and Wastewater Committee. You just need 30 more of those and we're all good, right? <laughs> That's right. 30 more three three bedrooms at 954, and we're home. I mean, just pay for the pump. Yeah. <laughs> 30 more. Huh? 30 more. 30, yeah. yeah, 30 more. Yeah. Right. I'll make a motion that we approve this wastewater allocation, water wastewater allocation request. That's yeah, just water. Right? Is it water? Yep. Oh, is this water? Okay, it's water. Water, okay, yeah, water allocation. All right. Well, wait, Chris, is this water or wastewater or both? For one thirty, it's just water. Just uh, water. Okay. No, so I'm no wastewater service in the sugar pump. Okay, so I'm just motioning that we approve the water allocation request. Second. 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Assembly permits for Chandler East Valley Community Group movie night and Green Mountain Stage Race. Do we want to take them all together or is there I just have one something? question and uh, okay. I can't recollect this from my time at Chandler and Perry you might have a better handle on this but has there ever been a conflict between the stage race and is the stage race is the day before the New World Festival. Yeah, yeah. I don't recall anything the yeah. issue. I, I, I didn't think there was no. any, but I'm just looking at the map of the course and it... You know, no, I think goes, it's... Yeah, yeah. Most of the traffic for the stage race is outside of the village anyways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They come in the village afterwards. Right, mm -hmm. right. No, I, and then they park at the high school? Is that what yeah, they, yeah, yeah, they same yeah, thing, right? right? So it's pretty much the same roof, same, same deal, right? That's what I thought. It didn't look any different. Right. How many years ago they said, you know? I mean, they all look the same. I mean, the Celtic Festival is the same. Yeah. So I just don't do them all at once. Um, I'll, I'll move uh, to approve all four assembly permits. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And our add on is the fire radios. All right. So, um, let me introduce this one for you, Trevor. <laughs> yeah, if you want to introduce it, that would be lovely. Um, so the Fire Advisory Committee that we end up has, has uh, all three of our departments and Brookfield on it. And we have one contract for uh, communication services that Brookfield is part of, too. And they pay, I think it's 25% of the cost for all of that. Um, for their contract with Orange County that was separate. So equipment they pay 25%, but they have their own dispatch agreement, I believe. There's been a lot of trouble with clear communication with the radios and the pagers. So they did go out to um, two vendors and had them look at it and decide what the challenges were and what had to be fixed. And so that's the report that's here. And you'll see where they not only went to the sheriff's station in Chelsea where dispatching takes place, they went to Beacon Hill where he has a repeater. They went to the tower in Randolph Center. And what this is, is the proposal from them on what it will take to clear up the communications for the department. And so of this charge here, the 6,800 estimate, 25% um, of that would be paid by Brookfield. Uh, of this proposal? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in, in essence, there are, I'm, I'm looking through all this sort of quite technical uh, report. They're, they're like drop signals, interference, et cetera, related you, to the... You'll get one tone that'll come through very clear. Yeah. And then the next one will be so staticky you can't understand anything right. they're saying. That's because the different pieces of equipment are at cross purposes. Yes. Of There's other paging companies on the tower. Mm -hmm. And so they're picking up part of interference right. from that. Right. Uh, the other thing is that the Beacon Hill isn't what's used to communicate with Randolph right now. And they need to run some wires to that and do some work on that, and then they would be able to, and that'll allow the transmission to be a lot cleaner also. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you as one that gets to listen to these quite often, sometimes you don't, other than the, the tone part that's at the beginning, you don't even know who's being toned and what, where they're to go wow. and what they're to do. Ooh. It's that bad. No, that's not good. So it's, and another time it'll come through in the middle of the night when it's not your department being toned and you're trying to sleep, it's clear as a bell, <laughs> just as loud as can be. I'm sure. <laughs> sure. Well, you don't live next to the train, so. <laughs> yeah. Or on top of it, like I do. Everybody's got to pay their price. I sleep through it at this point. So, yeah. so, so, um, one, what you say, 20% of this? 25% of it. It's paid for by. And, and where does this come from in the budget? 
fire department budget. Okay. Probably from the new there's a communications line that would cover that. Yeah, yeah I'm blanking on yeah. exactly what it's called, but I think that's that's the common name for it. Mm -hmm. The budget from the other company was uh, almost eleven thousand. acceptance of the Burlington Communications proposal for addressing the problems with the fire department uh, communication system. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Good. Grants. Kimball grant. We should advise them of their purchase order. It would be a good idea to complete that part of the process as soon as possible, to submit that as soon as possible, to avoid issues down the road that we've had with purchase orders before. And that will help everyone succeed. Mm -hmm. um, I think there needs to be a little more communication to them on some other things, because this went on with nobody knowing. I literally got this. Yeah, yesterday, yesterday morning that said, hey, last night we had this meeting at Fire Advisory, and can you add it to the agenda? It's within 48 hours. I think your meeting was within 48 hours, but today you're not within 48 hours. So um, mm -hmm. there needs to be some improved working relationship for that group. Yeah, that for would sure. be desirable, highly desirable. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's new. Um, it's the same. Oh, uh, yeah. It's all COVID related. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's all yeah, we need this for COVID. We're going to have to come up with a new, a new <laughs> definition for the get, acronym. Literate, huh? Yeah. Okay. I don't get paid to do that. Oh, you don't? Oh. Volunteer. Okay. No, that's what they say. Oh, really? Okay. Like permits for fireworks, right? Oh, all that stuff with the That's right. Okay. How'd that same work for thing. them? It worked well. We did it. Yeah, we took care of it for them. All right. Kimball Library Grant. <laughs> Courier grant application. Yeah, they've been very successful on the they grant sure run have. here. They really have. So this would be to apply for the Department of Libraries Courier Grant, mm -hmm. non-competitive, non-matching grant. So this is the cost of courier delivery of library materials for the purposes of interlibrary loan. But it's not much money, right? The grant itself is. For FY21, $590. Mm -hmm. Cover the remaining costs. Then for 22, we would go up to $2,147 for the cost of the service, but with the grant, that'll lower our cost that we're down to $1,334. If I'm reading this right. That sounds about right. I'll move to approve the courier grant application from the library. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stand. Motion carries. Old business. I have any for you? How about other business? Nice. I have some. Oh. I actually have one one piece of old business just to update people on the mural project. Oh, yes. Um, and I got the great news from um, Trevor today. Um, you may recall last time we met the original verbal agreement from the Jacobs is to uh, erect the first mural in the mural walk on the uh, north facing second floor wall of the barber shop. They, they reneged on that verbal commitment for a variety of reasons, um, most of which I got them earful about. Um, and um, we have since, uh, artist Phil Godenschweiger and I have since toured the kind of village with his eye to identify another mural location. And um, just this past week, we executed an agreement with Annie Liu to put the mural up on the third floor of 29 North Main, which is the building where Cleo's Sandwich Shop and Rachie Farrow's art studio is. So it's actually going to be on the third floor wall directly above the roof of where it was going to be previously. Perfect. Um, so, um, 
Uh, and Phil's now at the point where I, I communicated with him today, and um, we should be seeing a first invoice from Phil, which we'll be I'll pass on to um, to Cliff for um, the initial purchase of some materials so we can get started going. And the goal is to get it up in October at this Perfect. point. We want to get it up before the winter hits. So. That's great. And Annie was just ecstatic about doing it, um, so she's really really pleased. And, Rachy really went to bat for it. I was going to say, pretty, pretty appropriate sitting above Rachy's studio. So. Sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah. Good job. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My two questions are updates. One is North Randolph Road. Where are we at with that? Okay, the scoping study advertised. Everything's ready to go. It's just been sitting waiting for that level of attention to get out. But we've got the grant, the $32,000 grant. We've got everything written up. We just have to advertise it. And and start the scoping study process. Yeah. That's to see what the options are. Right? right. And one of them that we have to include in the scoping study is closure of the road per the state's edict. Yeah. How long does it take to complete that study? I'm trying to get the timeline is in the RFP. We're talking months, maybe th three months. I don't want to say three, but it's not super comprehensive, and there probably won't be a lot of the background, you know, some of the archaeological historic sites. Given where it is, it's some of the other factors that are part of that process are fairly minimal. It's just it's in the right of way, it's on the slope. So. Yeah. Okay. So by the end of this year, first part be, of next year. Yeah, like we that. should. I would think, based on the timeline, it's possible, probable to have information during the budget process, if we can get it out, say, in the next week or so. Good. Thank you. And my other questions for you, the fire committee that we created to look at fire departments, where are we at? Okay. Waiting for them to come back with a compensation process to finish the personnel manual. Um, and that now is involving League of Cities and Towns and the state uh, financial folks from uh, what used to be Bishka. Um, and it all is around workers comp and how to, to get that one. Uh, so that's there. The other thing holding us up right now are the risk assessments on some of the properties that haven't been done yet by their departments that are assigned to their areas. So. Last I knew, the state lab and the new Gifford buildings hadn't been completed. Um, the the uh, L.W. Greenwood site, now that that's changed, has to be done. That will give us the data on all the, uh, the risk pool for each boundary to then look at what's needed to, to manage that. Mm -hmm. That's where that's at. So still progressing at some point? Still progressing, but I will admit it's very slow. Very slow. I'd love to see it finished, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Get that done. Yeah, that'd be nice. But I think after we get the data, though, that's when all the grinding's going to. Moving forward faster, probably at that point. I don't think so. I think that's when the hard discussions mm -hmm. take place. And some of those will be. Oh, that's one's going to be challenging. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, but we do have a whole new personnel manual, except for those two issues. Uh, and the issue around payment is employee versus volunteer. So if you pay by hour, by call, by some type of account, they're de facto an employee, which then means Trevor is in charge of, the, of hiring chiefs and firemen and whatnot. You know how that'll go over. So they really want to be volunteers. <laughs> you really but want to sit in that meeting? Know. We'll be looking I for a new town manager. You'll be looking for a, a lot of fire department <laughs> people, too. too. Yeah. But, yeah. So your challenge is how do you balance everything so they have a town policy they have to follow, but they're not an employee. And then add on top of that the whole you know, if, if you have a job where you're paid and you have workers' comp coverage and you get injured at a fire, your wages are covered. 
But if you are a local farmer or a self-employed individual, of which a little more than half of them are on the Randolph Center and East Randolph departments, and you choose not to pay workers' comp on your wages, and you get injured at a fire, the only wages you get reimbursed for are the couple hundred dollars the town pays you under workers' comp. And I know we've had the discussion a couple yeah. managers ago many times, and he's like, nope, they're, all their wages are covered. Well, it's not true. So we have a lot of folks out there that are in a high-risk position as a volunteer to the town with no backing. So is the VLCT pro pro providing insights into what other, t I mean, I can't believe this is unique to no, Randolph. It's not, unique. It's not unique, but nobody's cracked it. And, yeah. you know, we're, what we're trying to get the league to do is agree to add a type of insurance that's similar to AFLAC, you know, accident right. insurance. Mm -hmm. So they get something while they're, you know, they're out and injured and, you know, it's not workers' comp, but it's kind, it's something. Right. So they get something and like they're not the really cost. too crazy about doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so. And I talked to two other towns, and they've said, well, they just know that that's the risk they're taking. Wow. And, yeah, well, that's, to that's, me, is a little harsh. Yeah, yeah. So part of the compensation is, do you pay for an insurance like that for them as part of what they get as a benefit for, for volunteering? And then if you, you know, there's models from if you meet X percent of the meetings and X percent of the trainings, then you get this bonus value. Mm -hmm. like, you don't want to have everybody sign up to be on the fire department not show up because they suddenly get an insurance policy and a bonus check, right? So you somehow got to encourage them to first off give up their time to do it, but second off come mm -hmm. and respond. Mm -hmm. And that's the trying to weave that right now is a little bit challenging. Hopefully. Thank you. Yep. Manager's report. Big news. Kim. She's here. Started Monday. So we filled that executive assistant. Thank you. you don't have a name tag, Kim. Your last name. <laughs> oh, I don't. I'm Grout. Kim uh -huh. Grout. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Thank you. So far, it's been wonderful to have the extra help, it's already made a big <laughs> difference, so very excited there. Um, Beanville Road Covert, we probably will have to extend the closure just into next week, but we got a detailed schedule on the remaining items. They're up all the way up with the backfilling, so the road has been put back so that it's at a spot where it's ready to be paved. Um, so what comes next is tomorrow, consolidated, it's supposed to come in, put that trench in, and for the concrete for the, the vault, basically, that its fiber optic lines have to go in. That sets up over the weekend. The lines go in Monday. The guardrails go in Tuesday. And then hopefully the paving will happen Wednesday. But if the paving isn't even scheduled for Wednesday, there's a really good rationale behind. The guardrails are the safety component that allow us to reopen the road. Right. And that might be the, the moment that we do that. So we say pave it when? And we pave it when we pave it, if, if we can't get that. It'd be nice to have it all done by Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, but if it doesn't and something happens and it rains and they can't do it, yep, that's as long the, as the rails are in place, I'm... Yeah. I'm sure there's a barrier could be put there, too. Yeah. Short I'm, term I'm just, until they could... I think that would be yeah. awesome that it was opened and it has to be closed again for paving. That's great, but... And that would be the other option is to open it up and then when they come back for... Right. How, I mean, I can't imagine that one will... Probably take longer to set up than it will to probably pave that yeah. section. We're not yeah. talking about a lot, but um, so I, I think the smart thing might be tomorrow. And one of the things I've been pushing the contractor for is this last two sets of kind of the rolling closure extensions. That wears on everybody because we're not able to give an answer as to how far and what's left. And so really pushing to say what is left, what's the timing, what's the order, and to keep pushing on. We can't keep the road closed indefinitely because we can't get a date from Consolidated on when it wants to do its work. And at some point, 
if the guardrails are ready to go in. They put the lines in with the guardrails in before. Mm -hmm. Giddy up. You know, that's the part we've got to do. It's got to start to move forward and move to completion. And I think in that push, and I was encouraged everybody to keep keep rolling with that. So that's the schedule we're on. Um, so hopefully by Wednesday, everything could be done if the paving falls into place. But I think by Wednesday, if the guardrails are in, we're, we reopen. Awesome. And figure out the paving layer. So tomorrow we'll send out the notices, do a little front porch form, a website thing that says there's one more extension. And um, so I hope to end it We'll set it late, end it early, but then explain what the steps are so everybody knows that this is the order. Of yeah, I think that would be important to just say this is, we're waiting on these pieces. We got three pieces, here's how they're ordered. Yeah. Um, and then we can open at this piece, and even if the third one's not done. And then that'll get us out ahead of everything. Do they have Jersey barriers on site for anything down there? They may on the south end. I'm not trying to picture when we were down there the other day. I don't remember seeing any as we came down from the from the businesses from the, the other side. When they close the site up at night, they've they've got the sign. They must have something up for when they close it. I'm I'm just not picturing it, but if they have jersey or jersey barriers, they could move them to where the guardrail's going to go and open it. Yeah. Until they can get. Okay. in there to do those other things too. So, yeah. It sounds like Lafayette will be there Tuesday to be able to zoom through and get those in. Are they ready for Lafayette ahead of Tuesday? That's what it sounds like. <laughs> no, I want to know what they are. That's right. <laughs> no, I'm question. serious. I want to know. Yeah. Well, I, I may know the owner of Lafayette. <laughs> you can get somebody to work Sunday. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but I'm also curious about the contract we have with these guys and what their performance scope was in there. Yeah. If it, we didn't have it very good, we need to make sure that's top of the line next time. For but future stuff. We really need to. They did not hit targets at all. Yeah. It had a sort of the, the more ambiguous completion date of December 1st. And then when you look through for even items listed to closure or some of the scheduling elements, it's sort of more of a standard contract, but I think beefing up some of those provisions and being more explicit, I mean, that, would have, that would have helped maybe to have an extra set of tools. The first extension with the rain and the subsurface soils. Can't argue that. Yeah. That's that just happens. kind of But he was really clear that that's all they needed. That's it, all yeah. we're going to need. We'll be done. Yeah. We'll be yeah. good. And yeah. then... It was discouraging last Friday to essentially say, what are we doing, what are we doing? And then Cliff and I went down there, and Cliff and I were the only ones on site. Um, and, the, and the road's half filled. And everything's meeting its compaction test, so it's not a quality of work thing, it's just a... And that was the, the most beautiful week we'd had in seven, eight weeks. <laughs> you think you'd be just... And this was three in the afternoon, it wasn't like we stopped over it. 7 p.m. Yeah, or something. They'd be jamming at that. Think be jamming? Well, I'll have a little empathy for all these businesses because there's a lot of them out there that are going through stuff just like I'm going through. When you can't find the employees and they call in and they don't come to work and you just, it's like, I'm telling you, it's not a, it's not a normal environment right now for sure. No. Okay. No. It's just not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of my compadres in the tent business called me yesterday and says, what do I do now? He says, I'm losing I lost two more guys, and my high school kids leave, and I've got to cancel contracts going into September, so oh, people aren't going to get their stuff. Vermont Tent was written up in seven yeah. days last week. Yeah, we're all in this, there's a lot of this going on, and mm -hmm. I know of a situation where there was a complete excavation company shut down in Morrisville because the uh, one of the, the guy's wife worked at a location where they got set up, so COVID hit three weeks ago and they shut the resort down she worked there. So they had to shut the resort down and then he went home or she went home and then he got it and it affected his three, four man crew excavating company because they all got told to quarantine. So I think there's a lot of this stuff. I mean, it's out of the control of some of these guys. I mean, yeah. you don't know how many guys you've got employed, how many show up to work and whether or not he's got another project. So. The credit card, I don't know if you think back to spring, the credit card processing we yes. have had some trainings completed at one today today or yesterday 
Is it today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there'll be another one, I think, to follow up. And so all we're really missing to go live is to um, load the buttons to the website was sort of was how they described it. In yeah, short. here. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. Pay, pay here by credit card. So the right. process is rolling along. Um, and we'll include all of the different elements listed from the clerk's office stuff to the, you know, the water waste water, some of those other buildings to the, um, the recreation pieces too. You need so. your front porch forum liaison to really boost that up when you do that, okay? That's one to really make a nice big announcement. Yeah, yeah. It's been a long time coming. So we're, we're really close on that, which, Great. Is, which is nice. So those are the main pieces. I'm trying to looking at all my, my notes here to see if I'm forgetting. I'm going to sign Larry some homework. <laughs> yeah, he's been here. Yeah, the absent guy gets the word, yeah, right? Yeah, right. right. All right. Yeah, your job to promote that. Where's, where's Larry today? Okay. Uh, if I remember his schedule right, he's either in Boulder or <laughs> somewhere at a higher elevation than that even. <laughs> he's out in Colorado. Huh. All right. Next up, we have an executive session on a personnel issue. Oh, we need to stop, right? Stop uh, after the board. Yeah. Okay, we'll so we'll to go into executive session. <laughs> Second.